Thank you, Dean, and, and thank you, Sydney. I'm having a good time. This is not my first time in Australia, but uh, it's uh, my first time at Pacific Plus Plus, so that counts. <laughs> I, as my bio mentions, I, I mentor people, so I, I help people who can understand the code they own, which is a very common phenomenon. So we've got a company that has some flagship piece of software that either runs their business or they sell copies of it as their business. And there are big pieces of it that, well, hmm, yes, one of us did used to understand that part, but that person doesn't work here anymore. So now we don't understand that part, and we need to change that part. And that's why they need to write me a check. <laughs> but I try to leave not just the code, but also the people better than I found them. And one of the words that comes up again and again when I'm trying to explain things to people is if you do it this way, it's simpler. It's more understandable. And I got, started getting some pushback on the word simple. And so I decided to do a talk about what I mean uh, by the kind of simplicity that I'd like to see people embracing in their code. It's not the kind of simple that happens when you're teaching something. So if I wanted to teach you constexpr or no accept or uh, auto lambda, you know, lambdas with generic returns and all that, I would write a very, very simple example that left out things like error checking. I would assume that if I'm parsing a number, that you'll give me a number and not a word. Uh, I would assume that if something only works for positive numbers, that you're going to give me a positive number. I'm certainly not going to assume that you might be trying to trigger like a buffer overflow attack or something, right? Focusing on what I'm trying to teach. I'll probably only do half the job. So if, if there's, this is the algorithm when element x is first on the list and needs to be moved afterwards, I won't show you the opposite for when it's later in the list and needs to be moved earlier. And I don't want you to think that this simplicity is like laziness or badness. This is actually an intelligent uh, pedagogical approach to trying to teach something. You focus on the one thing you're trying to teach, and the person who needs to learn that can then focus on the one thing they are trying to learn. I'm Canadian. Marshall McLuhan was Canadian. Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. And this is a true statement. Literally, we choose examples so they will fit on a PowerPoint slide. Literally, we choose examples so that when we open the code editor, you can see it without scrolling. And this, again, is not bad or lazy, right? There's a cognitive burden of scrolling. And there's a cognitive burden of squinting at a tiny font. So when I choose something so that it fits on the page, as a teaching decision, that's the right choice. And the other reason that these things sometimes are bad is because we made them up just to teach them to you. So if I'm trying to teach you something from the algorithm header, I'm going to need a collection to sort, find, count, whatnot. OK, let's make, mm, let's make a vector of integers. Well, what am I going to call it? I'm going to call it v, because it has no life other than being a vector of integers. Right? But in your real program, of course, you wouldn't have probably a vector of integers at all. You might have a vector of employees, and it would be called employees or uh, department or something. But our samples throw away that context because that context would clutter up people's heads. And so you don't have to argue about, I don't know, whether or not the seniority report should be sorted by date or by last name because you're not using real classes and real properties. You're using a vector called V. That's all fine until people come out of those classes and meet the real world. The real world is complicated. In the real world, you can't leave out error checking. In real world, you can't leave out input sanitizing. In real world, you have to move it forward as well as backwards, up as well as down. And you learn that pretty quick when you hit the real world. So of course, all your code gets bigger. And it gets mm, twisted up in itself. And what happens then is that some people think that's how it's supposed to be. That that was my beginner code when I was learning. Now that I'm a sophisticated developer, I have complicated code because I live in the real world. And if anyone criticizes my code for being complicated, I say, hey, the real world is complicated. In fact, I think sometimes there's a little bit of showing off in this. You know, if it was hard to write, it should be hard to read. Look at this wooden sculpture here. Somebody spent 
hundreds, thousands of hours, maybe, I don't know, a lifetime, carving this thing. It's flowers and trees and people and little doors that, for all I know, open. And I think the person was pretty proud of it. But it's behind a glass case, if you can see the detail on the picture. Because if you touch it, pieces of it are going to break off. That's a metaphor, all right, right, for our code as well. It is true that if it was easy, anyone could do it. But it doesn't mean that your code always has to look like this in order to be good code. There's more than one way to show that you have some skill and some powers and some capabilities. So I advocate for simple code, not the balls of Play-Doh, we don't need error checking, simple code. This is what I consider to be simple code. First of all, that it be expressive. If you have been to any C++ talks at all this decade, you've probably heard the word expressive, right? That this code shows your intent, tells people what you were thinking, tells people what you had on your mind when you wrote it. But it's kind of hard to tell people how to be more expressive. If, sometimes I can look at two things and say one is more expressive than the other, but it's a little hard sometimes to tell people how to change their code to be more expressive. So, I prefer to reach for things like readable and understandable. You know, code can tell a story. When it has words in it that are the words of your business, and people see an order, and I don't know, status equals shipped, and they see a function being called cancel order, like you, you understand what's happening here. It's, it's readable. It also shouldn't surprise you. You know that code where you read it and then you go, wait, what? And then you go back and you read it again, and then you read it again, and then like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, I get that. I, it's not actually a good thing. To have that moment of like, how would that work? Uh, uh, yeah, okay, I guess, maybe, hmm. And then you're left in that set of tension. You don't want the code to do that. You want the code to like just be, we go through all the orders, we find the ones that aren't shipped, we ship them if we can, if it's been too long, we cancel them, then we send the email. Like very straightforward, transparent. It's not hiding anything from you. When you read it, you can see what it does. When you read a function called, is order overdue? You know, you're gonna be very surprised if you go in there and there's some code about how many units are in it or whatever, right? I mean, you know it's gonna be like comparing the order date to today's date and with either a named constant or some other way of determining what constitutes being too overdue. I find code like that can actually be reassuring. You know, you're following along, you know what's going on, you don't feel lost, you don't feel worried, you understand the process. That's a good thing to aim for. How can you write code that the later person who comes after you will find reassuring and even pleasant to interact? I get some pushback on the pleasant sometimes. Like, it's work, that's why we get paid to do it. Okay, but they don't pay you less if it turns out you like it, just saying. <laughs> so I'm gonna advocate that simpler is better. But I do spend a lot of time on Stack Exchange. And on Stack Exchange, we jump on both feet very hard with any question that asks whether X is better. Because better is a subjective judgment. Right? We, if you want to know, like, should I go for vacation to Rome or Toronto, right? Uh, you're going to get a very different set of experiences in those two cities. And I can't tell you which one is better unless you tell me what you value, right? So, for example, if you would like to go ice skating, Rome would probably not be better. So we need to define better for this kind of way of writing code. Lots of different things that might make it better. You might be more productive in terms of lines of code per day. When I first started getting paid to program, there was this metric going around about lines of code per day. And it turned out that across the industry in the 80s, the average over a course of a year, not of one little spurty week, was about five. Each person was producing about five tested, shipped, debugged lines of code a day. I bet you it's not really that different now. So maybe if we could bump this up to 10 by writing simple code, that'd be exciting. Um, maybe it would be more correct, have less bugs in it. Maybe it would be more performant when it runs. Easier to read, easier to change, or I still 
hold this to be a value more fun to create and more fun to know that you were the one who have created that. You know, it was a famous sentence that nobody likes writing, but everyone likes having written. So same in the, of your code. So let's start with your productivity. Is it faster to write code that's going to meet my rules for being simple code? Look at this wooden sculpture here. This is clearly a much simpler piece of work than the ornate thing with the trees and the flowers and the caves and the people. But you know what? I bet it took a really long time also, right? Making everything smooth, making things meet at a nice, even, sharp, crisp edge at the tops of the waves. I bet you that was actually a ton of work. It is not faster to write code like this, okay? There's this quote. I'm sorry that I wrote you this such a long letter, but I didn't have time to write a short one, right? So as part of prepping an earlier version of this talk, I thought I should be a responsible speaker and figure out who said that. And here's what I found out. Uh, Americans think Mark Twain said that. Uh, most of Europe says it was Blaise Pascal, except for England, who says it was Samuel Johnson. <laughs> so as a Canadian, I have to tell you about the famous Margaret Atwood quote about not having time uh, for a shorter letter. But, but I mean, that's true, right? Going through and making things shorter, reducing duplication, uh, taking away redundancy, that, that takes time and effort. When you realize that, oh, the forward and the backwards are the same except for blah, and then you coalesce your two cases into one, that's work. And so I actually want you to develop a, a new set of habits as a developer, that after you write something, you look at what you just wrote, and you consider refactoring that, changing it. How can I simplify it? Now that it works, now that I hack something together, how can I make it smoother? How can I make it simpler? How can I make it so it tells a story? And it's really tempting to be like, don't be crazy. It's working. I have to go home now. But that time that you put in to polishing it is time that will be saved the next time anybody needs to crack this code open. So we'll set aside faster to write. But what about correctness? Here, I think we have a clear win. Generally speaking, complexity is where bugs hide. So take the example of RAII, the proof, if ever we needed it, that C++ people are terrible at naming things. <laughs> resource acquisition is initialization. Get a hold of resources in the constructor, clean them up in the destructor. What's the number one benefit? You cannot forget to call the destructor. It will be called. That's great. But it also means your code is cleaner. Instead of having pages and pages of cleanup in both the happy path and in all your catch blocks, right? you just create these objects that manage themselves. And their destructors close the file, release the mutex, let go of the database connection, what have you. So that the code that remains, the mainline code, is telling that reassuring story. So this is winning on both counts. It's simpler for the people who are reading the code. And yet, at the same time, it's more correct you can't forget cleanup. And I've had some wonderful wins with adding RAII to code bases where there were hard to repro bugs that disappeared when all we did was go in and move the cleanup to destructors. So someone is working through and they're like, and this is the block of code that closes the file, and this is the block of code that closes the database connection. <laughs> and so then here we would, huh, that's weird. We're not closing the file here. Kind of would have thought we should have. I wonder if that's what's causing, you know, bug one, two, three, or whatever that no one's been able to repro for five years, where sometimes the file stays open. So this is just one example, and they happen all the time, where moving to something that makes your code more readable and explanatory also makes it more correct. And generally, people find it by flushing out the long bugs this way. In general, I want you to look at places where you are leaving an opportunity to be inconsistent and take them away, because consistency is the opposite of bugs, right? That's really what all a bug is. If I, if I open the file and then print it, uh, a different thing happens than if I first print the report and then open the file to save it into or whatever. And that happens because somewhere something is inconsistent. So examples of being inconsistent would be, I can write two functions, or I can write one function and one of them can have a default value for the parameter, one of the parameters. The compiler doesn't care which way you do this. But it means in the future, 
when there needs to be a change, you don't have to remember to make a change to both versions of the function, because there's only one version of the function. Not every pair of overloaded functions is suitable for this. But you'll often see, for example, uh, calculate total, and then calculate total with a tax rate. And that'll include the taxes. Well, why not just have tax rate have a default value of zero? Oh, the poor computer is going to become exhausted multiplying the total by zero, you know, to add on the taxes. That's okay. I think the computer can handle it. Heck, let's even just have functions. We've all seen our share of that copy-paste, right, those 20 lines of code that get pasted in. I was in a code review, and I said to someone, that's a really strange variable name. It was, um, uh, let's say, customer something, and there was no customers anywhere in this code. And you know what he said? He said, well, I copied it from somewhere else, and it was customers there, and if I change it to what it really is here, then I'll, I won't, I'll lose my mental connection to the logic that I built when it was customers, and I won't understand it as well. You know you've been in this meeting, right? <laughs> so write a function, and, uh, and then, you know, again, you only have to change once in the function rather than the 20 different places that you copied and pasted these 20 lines of code to. Or if you're feeling really brave and you have a bunch of similar functions, consider writing one templated function that does what those 10 did. And this all leads to the same thing, which is when I have to make a change in the future, I make the change in only one place. And we don't get that inconsistency where I made it in one, but not the other, or I made it in nine, but not the 10th. When you move the complexity into abstractions, two interesting things happen. The first one pretty much guaranteed is the bugs go away. I set up abstractions, I move the cleanup for each object into its own destructor, the main line gets much simpler because it doesn't have all the cleanup in it, and we fixed a couple of resource lifetime bugs. But the other thing is that sometimes the complexity just completely goes away. I had 300 lines of mush that I couldn't understand, I made two or three classes, I understand them fine, I understand the main line fine, and there's no more complexity anymore. And some of that is things like RAII taking away some of the ifs. Like I don't have to say if I acquired the mutex because the object keeps track, right? But some of it appears to just be about our cognitive capabilities of how much we can hold in our heads at a time. And when we break it up into pieces that have names that you don't have to think about the insides of, the complexity can actually completely disappear. Worth mentioning also that if you're simpler is caused by embracing a library code, then someone else already tested that. Someone else already thought of the edge cases. So if you use something from algorithm to sort or to find or to count, it's not going to have an off by one error in it. If you write your own loop, well, maybe it will and maybe it won't. So that's another place where it's much simpler for you, obviously, to just use something from algorithm, then you're done. But it may also lead to more correct code. OK, is it going to be faster at runtime? If you expressive, readable, transparent, understandable, don't get all caught up in the technicalities of your language, probably not a good thing. Right. Compare these two for loops. Assuming that people is a collection of persons and that persons are relatively big, the first line without the piece of punctuation is going to copy each element one at a time into this P, and you'll be working with P in the loop. The second one is going to give you a reference, so it's going to spare you a copy. It's going to be faster. Is it going to matter? Like, I don't know, is this the main loop of your entire application? Is people a gig? Like, I don't, I don't know if it matters, but in general, there are these like optimizations available to us that require you to know something about your language. You have to know how arranged for loops work to know why you'd say auto versus auto ref. And I can't give you a workaround for this. This is actually the hardest part of the talk. You can write simple, readable, beautiful code, but damn it, you have to know what you're doing. Okay? And there's no substitute for knowing what you're doing, which includes all the places where things are handled, handily copied for you or converted for you or whatnot for you. You actually have to understand all of that. It may not matter. Fine. Like, don't change this till you have a perf problem, right? 
but usually you will not magically be faster simply because you chose to be simple. If there's a genuine choice between simplicity and performance, I will choose performance. But if is in bold. Don't tell me there might be a performance impact. Show me that there is a performance impact, fine, we can do it the more complicated way. Keeping in mind just how amazing compilers and optimizers are. Uh, Matt Godbolt did a CppCon talk, not this year, but the year before, where he was sort of trying to hand optimize something. No matter what he did, he kept getting the same assembly. Right? So he started with a really naive loop, and then he's like, oh, I can hand unroll it, same assembly. Oh, I could, I could cache things in a, in, a, in a table, and da da da, same assembly. Doesn't matter. The optimizers are very, very good. And if you're not measuring, <laughs> they are better than you. Okay, guaranteed. And let's mention library code again. Think about the job of someone who writes an implementation of the standard template library for a compiler vendor. That's their job. You think you can code circles around that person and your code will be, your raw loop will be faster? I don't think so, right? That's all they do. So library code won't be slower than what you would have written yourself and may be faster. Okay. So why do you want to write simple code? It's going to take you longer. Maybe it'll be more correct. Maybe it'll be faster. Maybe it won't. But I have this secret plan to make us all enjoy our jobs. So why would you enjoy Friday better if you wrote simpler code on Thursday? Well, the first thing I do after I write code is I read it. I mean, literally, while I'm typing it, then I step back every three or four lines and I read it over and I go, mm-hmm. And then I type some more and then I go, mm-hmm. And then when I think I like it, I test it. And I probably run it under the debugger and watch it run and make sure it's doing what I was expecting and that I didn't stupidly say less than when I should have said greater than and all those kinds of things. And that's a more pleasant experience if you are writing code that explains itself, that doesn't have any secrets or surprises. And if your habits are to write in this telling a story kind of way, then you will enjoy that first moment right after you finish typing it when you step back and you read it and you run it for the first time. Generally, that code that makes you go, huh, what? I, what? You don't dare touch, right? Like it takes you four tries to be sure how it works and then you're still not sure if you went on a fifth try whether you'd still have that opinion of why it works. So you're often afraid to change that kind of code. And, and how many of you spend more time writing brand new code than doing things to old code? Anyone? I am not getting one hand, I'm getting half a hand. So, you know, we work on existing code. That's really, I mean, that's not what you tell your aunt at the family reunion when they say, wow, you're so grown up, what do you do now? You tell them that you write code, but you mostly read code and change code. We all do. And this kind of code is easier to read and change. It can be fun, right? You're on this like voyage of discovery. Yeah, then we find all the overdue ones, of course, and we do this to them or whatever. Like, it's less of a mystery and more of a guided tour. But here's the other thing I need you to understand, and I, you probably don't believe it. Other people's code can be beautiful. And here's how I'm gonna prove it to you. Have any of you, even once, written beautiful code? Okay, lots of hands. How can that be? You're not me. I also have written beautiful code, and yet I am not you. And this is the truth. Other people's code can be beautiful. And if you can embrace other people's code, it's not necessarily a giant pile of mess. Okay? Uh, the canoe is here because of my story about how I built this gorgeous canoe from wood from the store. Okay? And you can build a gorgeous application from library functions. So I've been going into places and trying to teach people how to take a big ball of mud that no one can understand and turn it into something polished and smooth and, and complete, right? There's no pits or scratches in the surface of this little metal ball. And the first thing that I learned is that it's really hard. It may not look hard, like the big complicated wooden statue looked harder than this, but it's hard. 
because you absolutely have to know so much in order to do it. You have to know this language, including the new parts. You have to understand whether the code you're looking at is missing an opportunity to use something that's been added to the language. You have to know whether the code you're looking at is correctly using what it's trying to use that's been added to the language. But you also have to know the libraries. Embrace other people's code. That's nice. Who knows all the functions and algorithm? No hands. <laughs> one, one and a half a hand. Uh, there's, a, there's a CPP con talk called 105 algorithm functions in 60 minutes. And he delivers. So if you invest an hour, you will know at least the names of 105. <laughs> and I have to tell you, their names are, are terrible. OK? <laughs> like, I love that header. But there's some terrible, terrible names in there. And, and I have a whole other talk about that, which I won't start to accidentally give. But you have to know what's an algorithm, what's in numeric. Hey, Coral, that's a new thing. What's in there? OK? And uh, have that capability to be able to draw on that and say, how about we rip out this 200 lines of handwritten, platform-specific, yucky stuff and use something that was added in the standard in 2014 or 2017? And you also have to know the idioms that we use as developers, the way that we express ourselves and the patterns that you can recognize. That kind of simplicity is completely different from the balls of Play-Doh. I left out the error checking to keep this simple. I don't have any unit tests in here because I'm just showing you how it works. Nothing's left out. It's complete, right? And it's achieved through some pretty hard work. So you want the simple rules. Do you know what it says in my speaker notes on this slide? It says, bwah ha 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with the easiest. Then they get harder. So the easiest thing to do is simply to learn this code looks simpler than that code. You try to write it that way from the beginning if you can. But when it twists on you, because you have to add error checking, and you have to do forward as well as backwards, and you have to sanitize the input, to recognize, hey, this has gotten complicated. I need to do something to make it simpler again, to make it back to a story that I can follow and understand. And I have to take away opportunities to be inconsistent. In this little picture here, people often think it's Lego. It's not Lego. It's Lego Duplo Interop. <laughs> and the fact that Lego at all works is a miracle of consistency, right? Because you can take the ones with four by two dots and two by two dots, and they work together, all different sizes of Lego. And then on top of that, they, they interrupt with various sizes of Duplo. And that's because there's been very careful design and architecture to make the sizes all work properly. And it's, you don't notice it. Kids certainly don't notice it. But there's not just randomly chosen sizes. There's a tremendous consistency and a, a ton of architectural work that's been put into making Lego and Duplo interop with, each, with themselves and with each other. So one of the simplest things you can do is to name properly. I told you I'm a consultant. There's a joke that says a consultant is someone who will borrow your watch to tell you what time it is. But listen, if you're walking around with a watch on going, man, I wish I knew what time it was, then you know, for a fee, I'll be happy to look at your watch for you. <laughs> so you see this sort of thing. Here's a comment. It says, I'm going to total all the numbers in the vector. So I'm going to make a, an integer with the brilliant name of i for integer. And hey, this was obviously written by a very clever programmer because it's arranged four. Uh, we'll just go through and add up all the numbers in the vector. OK. Here's the first thing you want to do. Why is that variable called i? Right? The, co the comment tells you it's the total. So why don't we call the variable total? $100, please. <laughs> now you notice I'm almost out of slide. So you know what the next trick is? That work's been done. Right? Accumulate, which I always think of as being an algorithm, but which is actually in numeric, uh, will add up everybody in the vector. Now you have a verb, which is always a good sign. People know what's going on. Uh, people can look up accumulate if they don't already know it. You don't need to explain that it totals all the atoms in the vector, because if you look up accumulate, you'll see that's what it does. It even has you know, begin of v and end of v, which some people see as noise, and sometimes I agree. But in this case, it's making it very explicit that it's the entirety of the vector that's involved. The only mystery that's left is the 0, which is exactly the same as the 0 on int i equals 0. So nothing new there. The new code is simpler not because it's shorter, right, but because it's more expressive. 
because now it's called total instead of I. And because now it's using a known thing, accumulate, rather than a raw loop. Let's do some more names. Functions, probably the most important thing about a function is that it has a name. So if you've embraced the idea of refactoring where you pull out 10 or 20 or 30 lines of code into a function, even without any duplication, even if no other place in the code will ever call it, your only really reason you're doing that is to give it a name. And it's a very powerful technique. We've all been doing it for a long time. It's changed our code for the better. So understand that. That's what's important about it, is being able to give this function a name. But setting up an enum instead of having a bunch of constants or hard-coded magic numbers is giving names to numbers, uh, using const or const expert to give names to constants. And then there's variable names. <sighs> See where it says avoid? Because like this is my life, you know? I come into some function that's 15,000 lines long. <coughs> And it was written by a C programmer in like 1902. And the first 100 lines is nothing but declaring variables. And it's like double D1, D2, D3, D4, D4. Sometimes they'll skip D8. I don't know why. So we go D7, D9. What happened to D8? Um, yeah. Here's, here's a real code. Right? It's like, oh, it's all fixed now. I added a comment. So that's great. Um, uh, a friend of mine in FinTech told me, it's a terrible example, no one keeps money in doubles. I'm like, oh, you think so? Hmm. Uh, let, me, let me go on record as not being in favor of keeping money in doubles, but I don't think it's true that nobody does it. Uh, you know, a thousand lines later, we call get gross receipts and we put it in D3. And, and you're a smart person, right? You've got that lookup table now in your head. Right, this is D3, total revenue. And you have to keep looking, you have this extra indirection. Everyone's real up on performance all the time. That they don't like the extra indirection of like a linked list. But then you, you're taking an extra indirection of yourself every time you're reading this code because you're looking up D3 in your mental lookup table to remember that, oh yeah, that's total revenue. And when another couple thousand lines go by and we have some condition and then we, we take off 5% of D3, I don't know why. And then we compare D3 to D7, and it's like, are you confused yet? You still remember what D3 is? Now, you, it's on a slide. You just have to look up to the top of the slide. But in real life, and I've had this phone calls, Skype calls, where they'll say, like, if you go to line 8,792, you can clearly see, you know, that we're testing against D7, and it turns out we should have been testing against D9. I don't know. So simple, even on the slide. Obvious name, sitting there waiting in the comments. Now. Total revenue equals guess, get gross receipts. That makes sense. It's telling me a story. You know, later, under some conditions, I take 5% off of total revenue. And down here, if total revenue is greater than the old revenue, like, these seem like they couldn't possibly help. But you know what? They help tremendously. And they turn the code into a story that you can read. When you're writing those functions to give them names, want them to be short. Not so you can print them. Who has most recently printed code? This year, it's October. All year, I'm getting one and a half, two, three hands. We used to print code all the time. The last set of code I printed was a single function that was six or seven pages long. It had seven catch blocks, and several of the catch blocks had go-tos in it. Um, and the core of the function was a triply nested while loop where they were all while true. I printed that. I printed that. Uh, if you write the way I want you to write, you'll never print a function, right? And, and, and I don't care that it fits on the screen in the IDE either. No, no. The reason I want your functions to be short is so they can have one name. A 7,000 line function will not have a name other than process, you know, uh, that's a real name for what it's really doing. If your function does two things, update and print, then perhaps it's really two functions. The other thing I want to think about, what I call emotionally short functions. Now, I think I'm safe. I've had this slide a couple times and I'm like, I don't know how long accumulate is and like a standard library maintainer is right there and tells me the answer. So then I do the talk again, different audience, different group, and, I, and this time I say I won't choose accumulate, I'll pick a different function. I think I chose find diff, and a different standard library maintainer was in the room and told me how many lines long find diff was. 
Anybody? <laughs> Anybody know how long find if is? No? Right? Like, it doesn't matter, right? It might be one line long. It might be a thousand lines long, although I sincerely doubt it. But it doesn't matter. You're never going to step through it in the debugger, right? You're not responsible for it. And you may have functions like this in your own code, too. Uh, I, I work on a system that reads files into a giant array of, uh, well, I don't even want to talk about the data structure, and uh, from time to time writes that data structure back out to the files. Okay? And there's this function called update database. And update database makes sure that the file and the giant data structure are synced up. And it's like a little magic incantation before you do anything dangerous. Right? At certain points, you just call update database just, just to be safe. And then sometimes, again, after you've done it, you call it. And I don't know when it was written, like 1357 or something. Like, it's, it's a very old function. I've never stepped through it. It's not necessary to step through it. It's probably thousands of lines long. But it doesn't matter. The whole company knows what update database does. And they know when to invoke it with a little prayer. And nobody worries about what it does. It's emotionally short. The functions that get read and stepped through and have to be understood and internalized need to be short. The magic that was written five generations ago and that no one ever looks in, they're emotionally short by the fact that we never look in them. They're on the cold path. Here's some real code. I don't want to mock this code. It's really old. Uh, it, it, it was 20 or 25 years old when I found it, and that was some years ago. Some people have said to me, this is clearly C. And I'm like, well, no, because it's using stir and copy underscore S, which is totes C++. Uh, those are uh, Microsoft um, extensions onto stir copy to make it slightly less awful. Um, it's also using all caps false and true because it comes from something that was had to deal with Windows. And some of those Windows APIs are from before we had Boolean variables. I'm not making this up. Anyway, anyone know what it does? Well, it, it's working with something called LPCMD line and it's looking for spaces, right? It's parsing a command line. Not super sophisticatedly, but it is in fact parsing a command line. And one of the gross things it does is that when it finds the space, it writes a null character there so that it can use stir copy to copy up to the null. And then it writes the space back again. So it changes what you give it. This is really gross because it makes it hard to test. You can't give it a literal string to test because it's going to try to change it. So that's real code that I found in the wild, and this is what I turned it into. So I'm using a string stream, and I'm just getting the two things out of there. I threw the Hungarian notation away. We're big boys and girls now. We don't need that. And I also went with a lowercase false and true. And yes, it's shorter, but that's kind of not the point. When you read this code, you can clearly see under what circumstances this function will return false. Right? If it can't get the driver name or the pipe name, it's going to return false. In the old version, there are some return falses kicking around. One is if I can't find a space anywhere in the whole thing, then clearly I'm not going to be able to get two parameters, so it's going to return false. And the other one uh, further down is if I have found up to the first space and then I'm moving forward trying to find the other one, I still can't find anything, returns false. There's a kind of two steps removed from the actual problem, which is that I can't parse stuff out. Also. Do you like all the backslashes? If you've never used name pipes on Windows, um, only half of those are required. The other half are to escape the required ones, right? So hey, raw string literals are a thing. And so I put a raw string literal on the end of this one. This code is shorter, but more importantly, it's telling the story. I'm going to use string string to do the parsing, because parsing is a solved problem that I don't need to do. If I can't get my two verbals, I'm going to return false. Then I'm going to decorate the pipe name, and I'll live happily ever after. These code work identically, except that this code doesn't change command lines, so you can pass it a string literal, and that's a good thing, too. Oh, no, streams have terrible performance. Hands up if you were mumbling that. Come on. Yeah. The server stands up for days or weeks, OK? And it parses its command line when it first wakes up. I think we can handle it, right? We're parsing two tokens out of a, out of a stream. It's going to be OK. Don't optimize because you have like religious beliefs like streams are slow. That's not an optimization. 
Okay, other things you can do, practical things. Long lists of parameters. You know, seven, nine, 11 parameters to a function. Abstraction. I especially hate when they're all the same type. Here's a function that takes seven bools. You know you've written this one because it started with one and then you added another and then you added another and at some point you looked up and you've got seven or 15 Boolean parameters. Make a struct, then they can all have names and you can even make the default constructor for the struct set them all to false and then you only need to set the ones you're turning on and then you pass that instance of that struct into the function. Much, much more readable. Four integers for rectangles and points and things like that and I never know is that x and y followed by height and width or width and height, or x1, y1, x2, y2, I don't know. Nobody knows. So make a class called rectangle or make two, two points and pass those in. Sometimes a function takes a lot of parameters because it's actually multiple functions. Sometimes when you're reading through a function, you'll see that the first third of the parameters are only used in the first third of the function and then they're never used again and then the next third, and then the next third. And maybe what you really want to do here is have three different functions, each taking a smaller set of parameters. And now at your calling site, instead of just calling one function, you do have to call three. And I understand that sets you up for the possibility of what if I accidentally only call two of the three. A lot of these rules are, are kind of in tension with each other. That's where it helps to have some judgment. That's where it helps to have some wisdom. Another great way to strip out parameter lists is to make something a member function. I will see a free function being called with like employee.first name, employee.last name, employee.birth date kind of thing. You're like, why isn't this a member function of the employee class? And sometimes the reasons have to do with a real misunderstanding of how object orientation works. Um, I remember designing a customer object and it had a calculate monthly charges member function. And I had someone say to me, customers can't determine their own charges. Like, I can't walk into the phone company and say, I've done the math. I owe you guys a dollar. <laughs> That's true. I can't. But it doesn't mean that a customer object can't have, because it contained all the information that was necessary to do the charges. Right? So if it's appropriate to move something in as a member function and dramatically trim down your parameter lists, that's a good thing to do. It's called arrow code. I know the font is small. I know you probably can't read it, but what it's doing is it's making sure that a number of preconditions are met. Uh, X has to be less than a limit, Y has to be greater than or equal to zero, and some Boolean called shipping has to be true. And if all of those happen, the good stuff happens. The problem with this code is the good stuff is really hard to find. Right? It's also reasonably difficult to match up the error codes or error messages to the errors, and if you are the intern on your second day who is asked to add another condition, to this function, I predict you will not do it correctly. This is the exact same code. I didn't change the signature, I didn't change the behavior. All I did was I flipped each and every condition in the if. So instead of saying, if it's okay, keep going, I flipped them to, if it's wrong, leave. That saves me all the else's and that's why the font got bigger. It also happens and I didn't write it this way on purpose, it just happened, that the error messages actually now correspond to the conditions. That is, if x is greater than or equal to the limit, the error is x too large. That, that's just a fluky thing. It, that wouldn't, you couldn't count on that, but at least the errors are exactly with their conditions rather than at the bottom of the page, right? So this is a really simple thing to do to, to linearize arrow code and it makes a huge difference in that readability. And now the story is, you know, first we check all three conditions and if we pass them all, then we do the real work, which is much easier to find. And depending on your indentation patterns, uh, the old way you might have had to scroll off to the side, but here it's super easy to find the real work. Another technique I like to do, const all the things. I learned this one from James, who's here this week. Uh, we're not talking about getting const correct. That's a different game. This is literally about putting C-O-N-S-T into your clipboard buffer, maybe with a space, and just pasting it, right? On every variable, on every parameter, on every member function, just paste, 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 build, and anything the compiler doesn't like, take them back off. And leave everything behind the compiler was okay with. Because other people will learn from this. There are 10 variables here, but only two of them, you know, vary. And 
that's important. The number of mental entries in that lookup table as you read the rest of the code, you really only need the two that might change. The other 10 there were just constants with names. Cool. So it's astonishing. People say, this couldn't possibly work. And to prove it, they go and do it to something. And then they're like, oh, huh. Actually, that's kind of useful. Hmm. Now, it falls if you have in-out params. And you try to mark things const, but it turns out it's an out -prem. It's being changed. Maybe you didn't realize it was being changed. I actually don't think of that as a failure. I think of that as a success, because it's showing you what's happening. Um, and it's also a great time to consider getting rid of in-out params uh, while you're in that function. They are deceptive. That's all there is to it. Uh, oh, but I have to have an out prem because I'm returning two things. Return a struct. Okay? As a, as a stopgap, you can return a pair or a tuple. My pattern is usually that I start by returning like an int, and then I return a pair of int string, and then I return a string, uh, int string float tuple, and then maybe I get a fourth thing in the tuple, and then I give up, and I come up with an abstraction of whatever it is that I'm building uh, that I need to return from this function, so this employee or purchase order or insurance policy or something. Still on the easy list, keep up with what is happening in our world. Right? I did a talk about why, uh, what core guidelines you should consider using, and one of them was never const cast. And as part of the story, I explained the mutable keyword. And afterwards on Twitter, like a significant number of people were like, this mutable thing sounds pretty cool. I should, I should check it out. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I literally have a grown child who lives 12 time zones away from me who is younger than mutable. Okay. <laughs> He's, he's 24 years old. Mutable is older than him. So uh, learn what the language has. You know, use a ranged for loop because it conveys that information about, hey, we're using every single element in the loop. Don't make private constructors when what you really mean is a deleted constructor. And use non-static member initializers wherever you can. You know, these are new things for some definition of new uh, that will make your code simpler and much, much easier for everyone to understand. And remember, once again, that there is such a thing as a library. Here's the deal. When you're writing code, it is a social activity. You are communicating. Even if you're all alone in a team of one, you're communicating to the future. Okay, So you may not have any teammates to communicate to, but you have future you and even better future not you when you don't have to maintain this anymore and it's someone else's problem. And the only way you have to communicate, especially with the future, is in your code. So choosing what to put in your code is how you are leaving those notes uh, to the people after you. There's a, a saying about writing your code as though it's going to be maintained by a violent psychopath who knows where you live. You heard that saying? I heard a much better one on Twitter about a month ago now. Write your code as though it's going to be maintained by your child. I'd like you to set people up for the pit of success. I learned this phrase from Rico Mariani, who knows an awful lot about people and also about making computers go fast. It's a great combination in a person. The pit of success means that you set things up so that when people do the obvious thing, the no-brainer thing, the no-friction thing, they will succeed. They have to go out of their way not to succeed. So if you've got someone on your team who you wish would do more x, you provide them with situations where doing x is the obvious thing to do, and they have to go to some trouble not to x. We control the defaults we leave behind for the next programmer, or that we show to our teammates when we're doing commits and doing code reviews together. So if you set up opportunities to be inconsistent by writing two functions, now someone else has to maintain two functions. If you have three, four, five constructors in your class and some of the variables are being set to default values, if you set those default values in the constructors, whether it's in their initializer lists or in their bodies, they could get inconsistent. But if you set the default values on those member variables with non-static member initializers, that's only one place. You cannot be inconsistent. When you set that up, the people who come after you may never notice, like, hey, cool, I only had to change one place. But that's what you're doing for them. And that's a gift that you're giving the future, which might be yourself. 
if you write our AII and you put the cleanup in the destructor instead of some separate cleanup function that they have to remember to call, then they're never going to forget to call it. Again, they're unlikely to ever go, why did this just work? Oh, destructor, neat. But it still happens. And if you take the time and effort to get const correct now, you're just eliminating that day when someone has to play chase the const for hours or days of their life that they're never going to get back. You give things good names. You make your functions short. The people who come after you will continue to do good names and short functions. You declare D1 through D33 up at the top of the function, and someone's going to come along and go, comma, D34. <laughs> so set them up to fall into that pit of success, because it might be your own self that you're helping that way. Now, one don't, and I've been pretty sm slow on don'ts, but please don't be an architecture astronaut. I don't know exactly what this does, because I found it on the internet. But clearly, it's by a very smart person, because it's got an abstract factory and a concrete factory and uh, an abstract product. And there's lots of dotted lines, so that's important. A lot of people want to write complicated things to show how smart they are. And that's architecture astronauting like this is sometimes the right thing to do. But very often, it's setting up for a flexibility that's never needed. So like, oh, we can work with seven different database providers. But in the entire history of this company, we've only ever worked with one. But should any of the others ever come along, we're going to be ready because we wrote all this. And meanwhile, everything's indirected, multiply indirected in some cases. And it's not just about the performance cost at runtime of that indirection, but about that mental runtime cost for you when you're reading the code and trying to understand it. So you can hide everything behind layers and layers of abstraction and adapters and factories. That's not making your code simpler. And that, in fact, is a fundamental paradox at the heart of the advice that I'm giving you. Every single thing you do to your code to make it simpler, like giving variables names and moving logic into functions and inventing abstractions like an option struct instead of seven bools, taken too far, they make your code more complicated. I cannot give you the simple rules for writing simple code. And that's not. Uh, weakness in me, it's not a weakness in C++, it's not a weakness in software development. It's a law of the universe. Have you ever taught someone to drive? Or remember your own learning to drive? Questions like, what speed should you drive at? Right? Oh, you should drive at the speed limit. Oh, you just ran into the back of someone who was driving 10 miles an hour under the speed limit. Oh, OK. Uh, the speed limit or the car in front of you, whichever is less. That's nice, a dog ran out on the road and you hit it. Oh, OK, OK. <laughs> the speed limit or the person in front of you, whichever is less, uh, but put, putting the brakes on if you need to to react to obstacles on the road. OK, we had a sharp corner. Uh, the road turned, you didn't, right? What speed should you drive at is an insanely complicated question. And we haven't even tried what lane should you be in. Or I'm a new grandparent. The baby is crying. <laughs> right? This is a simple question, but it does not have a simple answer. And the same is true for our questions. Right? Exceptions, yes. Exceptions, no. When I say a function should be short, what do I mean? 23 lines? 27 and a half lines? What's the exact cutoff for a function constituting short? Uh, good variable names? Whether or not to use default parameters? Whether or not to use overloads? Whether or not to use raw loops and raw pointers? There are no crisp, easy, obvious answers to any of these. Even go to has its place. So then that brings us to where you start to need judgment and experience. You need some judgment and some experience to do things like giving stuff a good name. And you write your code. When it gets messy and snarled up, you smooth up your code. But that's not the whole game at all. For the biggest games, you need to change your norms. For your whole team, if you're part of a team. For yourself, if it's you so that your new behavior is to write it simple, to look it over and see if it's simple, to keep going back to see if you can make it simpler, that's really starting to get hard. An example that I got from Twitter, again, obviously written by a really smart person because it's someone who deliberately chose one of our integral types, in this case, uint8 underscore t. Only problem is that get size returns a 16-bit integer. 
Now you find these problems really quickly, like infinite loops reveal themselves, you know, quite quickly. But where a lot of people then go is like, C++ is so complicated. You have to memorize all the kinds of integer, right? There's 8, there's 16, there's 32, there's signed, there's unsigned. If you get it wrong, you get an infinite loop. That's not what's wrong with this code. Okay? You don't fix this code by declaring i to be a 16-bit integer or by using some decal something of get size. You fix this code with encapsulation. See, i and get size have got nothing to do with each other. Right? One's a local variable and one's a free function. What? If you had a collection, you could just go through the elements in the collection. That's what's wrong with that code, not integer types. And a lot of people, when they meet a little bit of complexity, they try to fix it with a lot more complexity, like you should memorize all the integral types. Usually the correct answer is to step back and to fix it with some simplicity. Okay? In this case, with having a true collection that you can iterate through using a ranged form. But that brings me to the next problem. Who knows what we all know? You'd be able to recognize things in messy code, see an old friend, and pull it out and use it. Oh, that should be arranged for. That's a neat skill. This loop starts at zero, goes to size. That's every element in the collection. I need a range four here. Or better still, maybe algorithm already did whatever it is I'm trying to do in this loop. Am I counting things, right? Am I totaling things? What am I doing? Maybe I just need something from algorithm. Sean's here. <laughs> Uh, standard library has a stack and a queue and all kinds of data structures that you do not need to write yourself. And, oh, if I could have a dollar for every time someone was just going to pop out over the weekend and write a JSON parser, <laughs> solved problem, right? Recognizing that things exist for you to use rather than uh, constantly doing everything by hand is harder than choosing a good variable name, but it has a much bigger return. I'm still iffy on this one, right? The immediately invoked lambda. Like, I, I don't know if I'm going to end up loving it or not. I love being able to make things const. I'll const all the things, absolutely. Do I want to just call a function, though? So I say int const i equals init i, or do I want uh, to do it through a lambda? And the usual arguments about whether or not giving this function a name is going to be helpful, right? Because lambdas let you see the code. So it's only a couple lines. Maybe that would be better than whatever name I could come up with. But this is where things are starting to get into the real judgment zone. What do I know? What do other people know? I know what an immediately invoked lambda looks like. But in my code editor, I can't make those round brackets out at the end bright red to, so that everyone knows that I'm invoking the lambda. So how can I make sure that other people will be able to read what I'm doing and understand it? And uh, another thing to recognize would be the raw string literals. Right? And again, it's a case of just saying, whoa, that's a lot of escape characters. What's going on? Is this something where using a rostering literal would speed it up? So you have to have this like palette menu of structures, library functions, language changes, whatnot in your head so that when you're reading the messy code, you know what to go plunk out and say, oh, I recognize something that would be better. But it still gets harder. You know it. Do your teammates know it? Someone asked me the very first time I showed that Accumulate example, what if the people I work with have never heard of Accumulate? You know, did I make it simpler? Or did I surprise them? I mean, they only have to look it up on CPP reference, but what if they don't know about CPP reference? A serious thing, you kind of have to know your team. And this is where we're maybe changing your team as part of supporting this way of coding in a simpler and more readable way. So you want to replace your complicated things but the adjectives here are important, right? Not just with idioms, but with familiar idioms. Not just with library classes and functions, but with well-known library classes and functions, right, that other people will recognize too. And abstraction, but with the weasel word appropriate in front of it, OK? Um, that people will learn. They'll learn what a rectangle is. They'll learn what a point is. They'll learn what a purchase order or an employee or an insurance policy is. Of course, we're not doing the Play-Doh. You cannot omit 
anything that's required just because that would make it simpler. You can't hide the guts of what you do behind too many abstractions, too much interfaces. What I like about things like, say, RAII, the old logic was hiding behind housekeeping and cleanup. And when that all moved to destructors, the, new, the logic itself shines through. What I like about good variable names is that you're not hiding the logic with this mental lookup table of D3 as total revenue. But you need to keep evaluating what you're doing against that and saying, am I hiding all the core information behind too much abstraction? And of course, software constantly changes. So it's not simple to say, I'll just type 43 into the code right here, because that's the simplest thing to do. right? That's making all future changes much, much harder. Uh, I'll just use a singleton. I'll just use a global. That's easier than changing the signature of all these functions. Eh, maybe. It might be simpler for you today, but it's certainly not going to be easier for other people uh, in the future. So you want your code to be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Uh, I saw a talk by Phil Nash in which he points out that although this quote is attributed to Einstein, I love this, Einstein actually said something much more complicated and someone else paraphrased it to this simpler version. <laughs> yes. So you have to look at simplicity in that context, right? So you want to just type 43 in, that's quicker than setting up something const or const expr or doing something with an enum or whatever that gives that 43 a name. But in terms of future maintenance, Clearly, that number having a name and people knowing that it's the, I don't know, uh, passengers per boat limit or whatever uh, will help those people who have to deal with your code in the future. It's easier to slam a global in now than to change all the parameters to a whole pile of calls, but it's probably not the future proofy thing to do, right? So remember that your simpler code, like your shorter letter, you have to take the time to write it. But then we get to the really, really hard part. You have created this beautiful, elegant, complete solution. It's a miracle of architecture. You can see how it works. You look at it, and it's obvious what it does. And you show it to people, and they go, is that all you got? That can't be it. You must have left out the good stuff. You must have skipped the error checking and the sanity checking and the cleanup because this, my five-year-old could do this, right? I thought you were an architect, and yet I don't need a diagram to understand your code. So clearly, you're just a junior programmer. And, and I've had that. We've taken like a thousand line function and, and made it into something that would fit on a screen and that any a manager could read and see what it did. And the manager has gone, I thought this was a hard problem. What have you been doing all this time? <laughs> so you have to be brave. You have to be able to defend this readable, understandable, transparent, expressive solution as being truly beautiful and the product of really hard work, not some five-year-old's first try. And that requires a confidence in you. I'm presenting you this solution. It's simple. You understand it. You can see what it does. Did I forget stuff? Did I not think it through? Am I really on the brilliant side of the line? You have to know for sure that you are on the brilliant side of the line. Because there will be people who are like, if I can understand that it must not be hard. And if it isn't hard, I don't know what you've been doing all this time. But also. You think you know your language. You think you know your library. You don't want, at code review, to find out that you could have used mutable and saved yourself a ton of trouble. And then people ask me about this all the time. They say, if everyone can read my code, if everyone knows what it does, where is my place in this company? They can bring in somebody fresh out of school who makes one third what I do, and they can maintain it. Like, good for you. Congratulations. You get to go on to something else. Right? Uh, you get to go on to a different project and stop maintaining this old stuff. I would never get rid of someone who's like, oh, you could understand that code. Like, we can't be having with that. I would never get rid of someone who writes beautiful, understandable, maintainable code. I would give them lots and lots of opportunities to create more and more beautiful, understandable, maintainable code. And if they allowed me 
instead of having five senior developers to have one senior developer and a bunch of juniors, think of the extra raise I can give to the senior developer that I keep, and it'll be the one who's producing that code. So if you're Captain Obscurity, who's like, oh, all my variables are one letter long, so no one knows what I do, hmm, if you don't want to be next to a Captain Transparency, who is uh, going to end up taking over for you. But most of all, when you read over the code you've just written, what does it say about you? Right? Does it say, this is someone who totally knows C++, this is someone who knows the libraries, this is someone who knows how we write C++ and understands our problem and is presenting it? That's really what you want to be able to reflect of yourself, just how far you are from being a beginner. Which brings me to what I want you to do, starting tomorrow. I'll let you have the rest of the day off. <laughs> starting tomorrow, learn. You're in the right place. You cannot avoid this. The language keeps changing. The library keeps changing. People make up idioms which may or may not catch on. You have to know all of this. Keep doing that. And you need to read, not just blogs and papers, but you need to read code. You won't know whether code is readable or not unless you try to write readable code and to read other people's code. Uh, at lunch today, I was on the Discord. We were talking about using the letters A and D instead of ampersand, ampersand in your Boolean expressions. Anyone know someone who does that? Yes. So someone asserted to me, oh, I'd be so confused. I'd be saying WTF all the time. I can't see how it's worth it. And I gave them a link actually to a blog entry of Chris's where he does it without talking about it. He's talking about ranges. And I said, if you're not looking for it, see what happens. And you know what? The answer came back like, you know, I just read it. it I, I expected that A and D would confuse me, but it didn't. I understood it. I read it. I barely even noticed. And you can't know that about yourself unless you try it. Go read some code. Is it more or less readable when people say A and D instead of ampersand, ampersand? Read a bunch of code and find out. This one's hard. I need you to care. I need you to care about what you're leaving behind with your name on it. I need you to care about what the next person finds, and I need you to care about yourself. Because we've all done that. Like, it's 5.30. I just want to stop. Just tell me I can stop. And I don't even care what's happening next. <clears throat> care. Let's check that in, but tomorrow morning, make it right. You need to test these things. If someone tells you that we have to write this in the more complicated way because of performance, they might be right. But they might just be repro reproducing superstitions that they've heard in the past. So test for performance, test for readability, test for all the things you care about rather than just assuming. And finally, communicate. Communicate with your code, but also communicate about your code. In official code reviews, but even just in conversations. Yes, I chose to use arranged for there because I really wanted to emphasize that it's touching every element of the collection. Yes, I changed the function signature to take a rectangle because I'm always confused about what the four integers are and I'm fed up of doing that and I just wanted to do it with the abstraction. Sometimes this involves revealing a little bit of a vulnerability. Like we're all, oh yes, I am very smart. I can remember seven booleans. I can't believe you can't. But you know what? Sometimes we can't remember seven booleans. And we pass false to verbose when we meant to pass it to trigger update or something. So everything that we do you know, needs to be discussed so that other people understand why we're doing it. It's not going to be magically more transparent if you just throw it over the wall and expect other people to understand your motivation. But if you do all of these things, and you notice they may be simple, but they're not easy at all, and you find yourself that confidence and that bravery to say, yeah, I thought this through, and I know it looks simple, but that's because it's so complete and so correct, then, boy, oh boy, you will have come a very, very long way from being a beginner. And that's the kind of simplicity that I want you to think about embracing. Thank you. I have like one or two questions worth of time, I believe. Um, do you think a lot of complexity is caused by misguided coding standards and that sort of thing? Uh, sometimes it's a misguided coding standard that uh, tells you, you for example, uh, declare all the variables at the top, that kind of thing. Uh, or never use exceptions, and then people are tying themselves in knots, checking error codes and whatnot. 
Um, but I think the majority of it simply appears organically over time. You start with a very straightforward thing, and then you're like, oh, wait, what if it's negative? So you add an if, and then you're like, whoa, but on Tuesdays we do it differently. And you know, it just starts to kind of get uh, braided together. And uh, you add a parameter, and you add a parameter, and you add a parameter. And very often, it's about this pit of success. If the function already takes 10 parameters, and you're adding an 11th, are you going to stop and introduce some abstractions? Or are you going to be like, well, 10 was fine. So 11 should be fine as well. And, and these 7,000 line functions with the giant switch statements in them, you know, they started out simple when there was two possible reports or two possible file types. And now there's 10 or there's 20 or there's 100. Who's the person who stops and says, put on the brakes. We need to do this a simpler way. It's very often difficult to get the time to do that just as things grow. I, I spend a lot of time in 20 and 30 year old code bases, so I meet a lot of it, but it happens much quicker than that. You'll find it in two and five year old code bases. Um, I have a function print and display as you give an example. I broke it into two functions, print and display. Mm -hmm. So what do I call the function which calls these two functions? <laughs> yes, if you always print and display, then I suppose maybe you would have a function called print and display that called the two of them. Even then I think it would still be clear about the demarcation between the two things. But the other thing that sometimes happens is that print and display has a, uh, a flag that controls, like sometimes we only do the first half and we return early, and sometimes we skip the first half and only do the second half, and it turns out that the consumers of that API over the decades would actually like them to be two separate functions. So some places you'll just call both of them, boom, boom, in two lines of code. You don't need to call a different function to call both of them, and other times they'll be called independently. And there can be a genuine benefit to the rest of the the users when you do that. So that it's, that's a no-brainer when I see it with the control flags at the end, which I have seen. What's your opinion on commenting code? Because you showed how you can get rid of some comments with good naming, but is there ever, like, when would comments be necessary, I guess? So I'm certainly not one of these comments are a code smell people. Um, I do think comments convey some really powerful refactoring opportunities. So if you see a block of code that's 20 lines long, and at the top it says, find the unshipped orders, I clearly need to write a function called find unshipped orders, right? But other times a comment will be, um, especially when it's a why, uh, someone will just say, this has to be zero, or I know the documentation says whatever, but it's not true. Um, that, those are good. Uh, I also will see URLs where, uh, you know, inspired by, or this is a patch for, and then there's a link to a blog or whatever explaining it. Uh, those are fine, they can stay. Uh, where, where I have a block of code with a label, I want to make it a function where I have double D3, <laughs> comment, total revenue, that can go. So a lot of them will go away, but I'm never going to say like, oh, we should be comment free. I think comments are fine. Oh, the other ones I hate are the like, John Smith, January 3rd, 1902, you know? <laughs> and I knew some people who that was their work tracking. They put work item, work item numbers on the end of every line they would change. So it's like slash slash 276, and you could go look up work item 276 to see why this line encoded code had changed. Uh, we are luckily long past that now. <laughs> yeah. So don't do the job of your, t of your version control system or your work item tracking system, but some will still remain, and, I, and I'm not anti-comment at all. Uh, hi. I was wondering what your heuristic was in terms of determining when to or not to alias types. Aliasing types? Um, it's about confusion. So, for example, uh, I still come across code that goes type def struct something underscore s, blah, 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 semicolon, and then something. I hate that. Like, we don't need that. We don't have to say struct, so we don't need the type def. Um, but if you're going to declare a function pointer, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I do uh, individual usings. I, I try not to use namespaces, but I do individual usings, which is not exactly an alias, but I like that. Yeah. This will be your last one. Last one, apparently. Hopefully it's a short question. Um, how do you go about trying to introduce a culture of fighting complexity uh, versus other teammates the, that are? So the culture change is really hard. Yeah. Um, that, 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 like, that's in, listed under hardest for a reason, uh, because People say, I just want to do it and go home, which is a legitimate position. And they don't necessarily see it as an investment in making it easier next time. Uh, and people kind of get that, well, I made a fantastic statue with all the flowers and everything on it. And it's so amazing it has to be behind a glass case. Why do you want to turn my work into a wooden bowl? Um, 
Best thing you can do if you are in the hot path of code that's changing all the time is to actively celebrate when it helps you later, right? So to actually like over lunch or over coffee, be like, man, you know, I had to add another foo to the whatever. And I was like, oh, because you know that always takes a day. But you remember how I changed it? six months ago, and when I went in there this time, it was like, it was almost magic. I put another thing in the enum, I da-da-da-da-da, and I was out of there. And you get a couple of wins like that, and people get it. So I was on a system that had something like 200 report types in it, and there was literally a 27-step procedure for adding a new report, most of which involved go into the 5,000-line switch statement, find the case that's most like yours, copy it down to numerically where the new case belongs, change the number, and then start editing it. And we changed it to something involving virtual functions. And the next person to come along and add a report who didn't have to follow the 27-step procedure sent out this giant email about, oh my god, you won't believe what just happened. I just added a report, and it was so easy. That sort of thing really starts to bring home. There, it's not just aesthetics. This, none of this is about style or prettiness, right? It's about when you come to do it next time, is it a 27-step procedure or is it a three-step procedure? And that's what you want to be able to show that you're getting to. Otherwise, it's just engineering for the sake of engineering, which I'm not, not going to support. <laughs>